woman just got tired of typing it. Maybe. And he didn't have like any macros in his word processor. So he's like, screw this. That's Jeez, a lot of pe- that's not a peck a lot of peckles. That's a lot of peckles. Exactly. Peck a little peck a little peck a little, talk a little, peck a little, talk a little, cheap, 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 talk a lot, peck a little more. Peck peck a little more. Oh, Wait, what's that from? The music man. The yeah, what the what? The music too. man. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He sells I knew clarinets that. to the kids in the town. Okay. <gasps> It always makes you think of Wally, right? Isn't that in Wally? Uh, tr- no, that's uh, My Fair Lady. Oh, it's My Fair Lady. See, mm-hmm. I'm terrible. I'm useless. Man, I could go <laughs> off on such a weird. I'm already a little punch drunk, apparently. <laughs> uh, are y'all ready for this? <laughs> oh, yes. no, we weren't ready for this. Okay. <laughs> Lego Shack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. It's going to be a good episode, guys. This is going to be awesome. This it's is going to be, be so, so fun. great. Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materialist. You, it, ugh, start over. Hello, and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. I'm Alaric, and joining me are Joanna and Travis, and we're diving into The Subtle Knife, the second book in the amazing His Dark Materials trilogy. We finished The Golden Compass, and we're into chapters four, five, and six of The Subtle Knife. Joanna, you want to take us there? Absolutely. So after hitting a dead end, Will and Lyra separate to pursue their own interests while in Oxford. Will finds that much of what he needs to know about his father is a matter of public record. He writes a short postcard to his mother, then heads to the library to do some research. Meanwhile, Lyra looks for a quiet place to consult the alethiometer. She ends up in a museum where she discovers an exhibit containing the exact furs and sledge from her kidnapping in the north, along with a photo of the same Samoyed hunters who took her to Bolvanger. Close by is another exhibit showcasing a number of human skulls, all of which have holes bored into them. The alethiometer reveals a strange truth about the skulls that Lyra doesn't fully understand. Shortly after, she is approached by an older, gray-haired man in a linen suit who was quietly watching her from the upper level of the museum. He tries to get Lyra to come with him, but she declines. After consulting the alethiometer again, Lyra finds a physicist named Dr. Mary Malone, a former nun who researches dark matter and something she calls shadows. Dr. Malone explains to Lyra that shadows are conscious and they cluster around humans. Lyra realizes they are the same thing as dust and convinces Mary that she can talk to shadows. Will learns more about the Arctic expedition his father was on just before he vanished. Back in Chitagaze, he reads his father's letters and finds out that just before he disappeared, his father was looking for the same kind of hole in another universe that Will fell through. In Lyra's world, Lee Scoresby searches for Stanislaw Grumman and accidentally kills an agent of the church. Serafina and her witches enter the world of Chigaze and learn about the specters and the Bene Alim, angels who are able to pass between worlds. Ruta Scotti leaves the witches to follow a flight of angels as they make their way north. As they approach a large mountain range, Ruta hears the clanging and pounding of the fortress Lord Azrael is building at the end of the world. So, where do we stand here, guys? This this was uh, an action-packed week. Very much so. Well, actually, let me take that back. Not necessarily action-packed, but there was so much information conveyed. In Content. A non- yeah, and, and, and it wasn't um, uh, a lot of exposition. Yeah, there was, yeah, real information was delivered in mm-hmm. a meaningful way. We got mm-hmm. back with with our girl Lyra, and we had we spent some real time with her, which mm-hmm. was maybe the most significant part of these three chapters was, you know, her and Mary Malone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that really stood out to me as like the real real kicker. Uh, but let's start out with you know Will. So what is so we sort of pick up Will. Will is is out and about. Um, Joanna, you were saying that not much happens here during this sequence. I, I just feel like. Will Will's little like series of events is just kind of like meh. 
Yeah. I mean, Lyra has all these really kind of crazy things happening. Um, weird men are following her and the alethiometer is telling her all this crazy crap. And, and Will's just like, you know, he calls a lawyer on the phone <laughs> and then he goes to visit the librarian. Will and super basic. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, I guess I kind of wished for all the, for as exciting as Will's background story is, I just felt like there was, we didn't get as much or hardly anything from him really at all. He's treading water here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The plot is moving on without him during this bit. Agreed. But he's catching up. He's getting information. He's getting caught up in this, in the, in the world. Like Lyra had a whole book to, to learn about all of this stuff. And for Will, this is just like, he's just gone from, well, my mom's a little bit crazy. And then there's some dudes who want to get, you know, her purse or the bag. And, and now he's like jumping through multiple universes and all kinds of stuff. And his dad's involved in it. I kind of think uh, Will, Will's due to just kind of sit and take some of this stuff in for a while. Yeah, we, what we do get out of the conversation with the lawyer is uh, we find out where his money comes from a little mm -hmm. bit that there is a trust set up that is depositing money periodically. Did it say how often it was? Every three months, I think. Every, okay, yeah, every right. three months. So a significant amount is is deposited. The lawyer is not able to confirm whether Will Perry is alive mm -hmm. uh, because he, um, not Will Perry, Will Perry is our guy. John. Uh, his, John Perry is alive. Uh, and Will does, he sort of mines him for information and he doesn't have much. Mm -hmm. And it's no. been like, what, 10 years now since he's been missing? Or, or just has, we haven't heard, heard from him in 10 years? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's about that. And um, the lawyer, I mean, he's just, he's collecting checks, he's doling out checks, he's got a process that he does now. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, I don't know how much money uh, is there, but it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight for the amount of money that's coming in. But uh, it kind of makes you makes you think, though. Why are adventurers always rich, guys? <laughs> <laughs> you don't go into adventuring unless you're rich. That's true. You probably, you probably true. start out rich, then you become an adventurer. That's you true. Don't you don't make money adventuring. You don't work a nine to five and then decide I'm going to be an adventurer. But isn't but, uh, adventuring so much about getting funding for your adventure, and then that sort of cancels out the fact that adventurers are rich? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the, what is it, the, the snake eating its own tail of adventuring. Well, if you find something of, sorry to get off a tangent here, if you find something of value, are you Indiana Jones and say this thing belongs in a museum? Mm -hmm. Or are you, are you, are you Belloc? And you're like going to enrich yourself with finding these antiquities. Uh, that's a question, I guess. Like, uh, you know, Belloc is the um, is more of an adventurer than Indiana Jones, right? Indiana Jones is like the straight up archaeologist. He's, he's Belloc a is a hang on. Belloc is a thief. He just follows Indy around and takes the <laughs> stuff away from him as soon as Indy finds it. That's true. That's <laughs> it true. true. It is true. Over and over again. Okay, sorry to get off the <laughs> Uh Hey, this is a nerd, basically a nerd podcast, so we can talk about that stuff. It is. All right, so the lawyer doesn't really pan out, although we get a little bit of information. I don't know if Will is satisfied with, with what he gets, but it sort of keeps him moving forward, and he wants to find out more, and this is when he starts gathering information from these microfiche. Right. I mean, the, the lawyer is so ineffectual here like i'm almost like why even add him in i mean he yeah. there was this weird part where he kept saying well i have something i can tell you but not over the phone not over the phone and he wanted to like meet will and will was like i can't i've got to go somewhere and he kept kind of saying that he reminded me a little bit and i can't remember the name of the of the lawyer now but the one in like series of unfortunate events one that always coughs and he like doesn't ever really do what the children need but he's just sort of there to move things forward like that's how i felt about this lawyer guy. This guy's a lawyer of finance. He's not a lawyer of anything else. He's just managing an estate, maybe that kind of lawyer. Mm -hmm. But you're, you you bring, you bring up a good point, which is he does he is trying to entice Will to come to him. And what we find out later, which I guess we could talk about now, is that Will sees at at, at one point Will is very close to 
walking into his office and he sees the man, the very pale man with Mm -hmm. the pale eyebrows Mm -hmm. and pale hair that stood agape looking at his dead, you know, compadre with a broken neck. Mm -hmm. So was that the first time that he had visited the lawyer or was he sort of periodically checking there to see if Will had shown up? I think probably the latter. Mm-hmm. Same. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And Will and, uh, dodged the just, bullet. Just so you know, in my head, the pale guy uh, was entirely uh, Draco Malfoy in my head. <laughs> uh, grown up? Like yes. the one from The Flash? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that works. Yeah. I, yeah that works very well. That works very well. Not slicked back hair, maybe a little more tossled, but... But but that kind of look, right. yeah, I'm with that. Right, like Tom a, Tom Fenton, I think his name is Tom right? Fenton. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See, I was picturing more of that like scary guy from that movie with Tom Hanks that was that terrible book that I can't even say the name because the it was so Code. terrible. Yeah. Shh, I said don't <laughs> say it. You will invoke all the terrible. But that was played the, by Paul Bettany, and I right. could yes. maybe see a version yes. of Paul Bettany that could play right. this part. So that's I I he it actually to me felt more like sinister like that like in that way and that's who I kind of envisioned when I, I was that. reading yeah. it yeah yeah I can see that too yeah. Yeah. maybe a marriage of the two mm-hmm. yeah uh, so so jumping back a little bit um, so that we sort of finished up with the lawyer um, there is some suspicion there he's visiting. You know, visiting the lawyer obviously doesn't happen because he sees the, his nemesis there. Um, so what about Lyra's day out? What does she do? Big adventure. Yeah. Big. Starts off at the museum, seeing her um, doppelganger of her clothes, her clothes to her gangers in a museum. This right. This kind of scrambled my noodle a little bit. This uh-huh. was like, okay, wait, what is happening? Especially the bit where the lithiometer says, oh, this is um, 33,000 years old. Yeah. Right. It was like the lithiometer just came out of nowhere. Ancient, super ancient civilizations, boom. Like, yeah. Wow. Wow. Because it says it's the Bronze Age, which is not 33,000 years ago. Right. It's like five or 6,000 years ago. Yeah. So uh, that was a little bit of a shock. Not necessarily to Lyra. She just sort of takes that information in, sl- in stride. I'm not sure she's blown away by the age, but more that the, you know, everything that she sees in this diorama is like basically a carbon copy of what she literally just saw and just was involved with, mm-hmm. including the way something was tied or mm-hmm. retied. Mm-hmm. She noticed that about that. She goes, I know I didn't get that wrong because I was inside that sledge and I was looking at it. Right. You know, you, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with something. Um, Lyra wasn't taken aback by the uh, 33,000 year thing because she didn't know that it was supposed to be 33,000 years. And I feel like that is what's key to, to her being able to adapt to so many of these situations. She doesn't know otherwise and she's just gonna go she just goes it's like okay i'm just this is this is what i accept and just goes with it because anytime she runs into a situation that uh runs counter to what she knows she kind of she hesitates quite a bit and we we've seen that so far in um her first exploration of oxford when uh, she was taken aback by jordan college not being there i think a particular gate not being there things along those lines same thing's happening here. She's in the museum and she sees all these things that she has in her, she has her own context for. She knows where they belong and they're not there. And it's completely thrown her. Mm-hmm. And trepanning, mm-hmm. which is this next piece of this is she seems sort of a line of skulls with a bunch of, they're all, all trip hand, but maybe it's slightly, some of them are a little bit different than others. Mm-hmm. One of them has a, an arrow in it. Right. Uh, and the, the alethiometer gives him, gives her more information about these skulls. And, and what is that information? It's kind of, whoa, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love the way they say it. It's, it's that, um, the skulls that the trepanned, trepanned, trepanning, skulls? trepanned, like trep- the one... tre- trepanned. Yeah. They, um, they had more, 
dust around them than the one like there was one there that just had like an arrowhead like yeah. that's uh-huh. where the hole came from like and the arrowhead was still stuck in there um and so the alethiometer tells her like hey the ones that have you know with the like man-made holes like on purpose they, those have more dust i love the way it says it too in here because it says, and then the alethiometer, in the casual way it sometimes had of answering a question Lyra hadn't asked, added that there was a good deal of dust. Like, the, I this love is, that. This is the best. And this is where you see that the alethiometer has some level of consciousness. It kind of decides what to tell her in a way. Mm-hmm. It will answer questions or tell truth. We were joking about this last week about it was like, oh, come on. This is what you this is all you're giving me. You know, uh, it was a dream about a head. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like uh, it has moods mm-hmm. and she's mm-hmm. and, and, and this, it's sort of displaying it here. It's giving her just sort of like whatever information that it thinks she needs or just decides to tell her whether she right. needs it or not. I think it's really interesting about the lithiometer. I don't know mm-hmm. that. We've really picked up on that until this moment. It seems to be a very methodical way of, of telling her and her understanding what it's telling her. But now it's like either their their relationship is deepening in some way or this is just what it is. Right. C- very conscious. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it could be a combination of the two, that their relationship is deepening because it's conscious and it's starting to uh, you know get used to her. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the guy, um, the elderly man in the pale suit. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think? He seems to have some awareness of her. Um, maybe he doesn't necessarily know who she is. Maybe he's been waiting for someone like her. He approaches her to me in a way that says that you don't just walk up to 11 year old and just talk, talk to them. You don't go from the second floor to the first floor and, and sort of get so close to her that he brushes against her with his hand. He's very close to her. Uh, yeah. He has a real interest in her and it's not just because there's a kid that's interested in history. There's something more here and he has to either recognize her or he's heard of her, you know, this, a chosen one. I mean, like, I don't know who is this guy. Linen suit. Too. I don't. Yeah. Speaking Joanna, of Belloc, what did you think? <laughs> I I mean, whenever an adult approaches a child in anything, I'm always like, ew. Yeah. Get like away. When, Get away. When the, yeah. When the guy bought her in the golden compass, when he was like, "Let me give you a coffee," and hey, you want to nip it? Like I was just like, ew. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I got yeah. the same ew here. Like yes. There's just no. There is no good reason for an adult to talk to a child. Like, yeah. like, you know, who's alone, who's alone. Right. And, you know, what's great is she again, she, this is where she can seamlessly put on. She became Lizzie mm-hmm. and she had, you know, she has her wits about her enough that, you know, because then it's really creepy. He's like, well, hey, I know somebody that has that's done it. Do you want to come meet them? Which just felt like, I don't know, just felt like, hey, there's candy in my van. Like, it just mm-hmm. I, I yes. oh, it made me feel kind of gross. And then she's, you know, obviously she's a liar. So she's smart enough to be like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm going to yeah. go this way. Mm-hmm. And she does. And he doesn't follow her. But it was just an all around, like, er, ugh, icky yeah. scene for me. I am with Joanna on this. I had the same ick the entire scene. And I think we were intended to, uh, uh, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, right from the get go, when she said he reminded her of someone, somebody, mm-hmm. my first thought was that he was intended to remind her of that guy from the first book, the one who tried to buy her coffee. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. that's, right. that was the first thing that I thought of. And then he, like the smell, like the, the, of, he didn't stink, but he reminded her of stink, you know, of like yo right. and like grossness and how is yes. And and the the worst part, the little dark tongue point. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Just, yes. just so so disgusting. Mm-hmm. And I'm I, I was so glad that she has that streetwise second sense that just tells her how to get out of these situations. Mm-hmm. Because this guy was so obviously up to no good. He is perfumed. Mm-hmm. But she smells rot on him. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Like Yofor's palace, mm-hmm. uh, he is mopping his brow a lot. He seems very out of place. There's so many things about him that are out of place. I'm trying to find a line about 
uh, how he how Pullman describes this like casual touch. And I was that thing gave me the like my hair stood on end when I read that. Well, I well, and a couple of things. Number one, I, you know, I think like he describes him as powerful, a powerful looking mm-hmm. man that even though he's older, he has gray hair, you know, impeccably dressed with this Panama hat, um, you know, that snowy handkerchief. But I think the other part that makes it so creepy is it says that he's been watching her for some for some minutes. And then it said he watched her closely, taking in all of her. Yes. Her rough, untidy hair, the bruise on her cheek, the new clothes, her bare neck arched over the lithiometer, her bare legs. Like, mm-hmm. it's just it's just so uh, gross. And, uh, and that uh-huh. flick of the tongue made me think of um, when David Tennant played, like, Barty Crouch Jr. Yeah. And just had yeah. that kind of gross, just like, flood it. And I'm like, ew. Mm-hmm. You know what I kind of wonder though. Now, when you just you you mentioned how he was uh, powerfully uh, pow- like powerfully built or whatever, I wonder if he's not this world's version of Yofer. Hmm. You know, white linen, snowy handkerchief, big powerful guy, black tongue. How he looked at Lyra in a way that was like how he wanted her in a way. Um, Kind of like he's like, maybe he's, and he's in like, he's in that part of the museum. Hmm. I wonder if maybe he's this world's iteration of Yofer. Hmm. That's an interesting take. That is. Uh, I did find that passage. He seemed nice enough. He certainly smelled nice. He was closer now. His hand brushed hers as he leaned across the case. Mm-hmm. Yuck. Ugh. You know how close you have to be to somebody to brush their hand with your hand? Yeah. And somebody who's 11 years old and maybe like four foot four. Yeah. And this is a ugh, gross. OK, right, we, we can leave, we can leave him behind. <laughs> His name was Charles. We're done with him for right. at least for now. <laughs> um, so so let's go back to Lyra's so Lyra's big day. She finds her way to uh, she kind of pokes around a little bit. But she eventually finds her way to um, a door that says um, th- this uh, this particular room. People are studying dark matter, uh-huh. but it seems to be maybe running out of gas. This particular um, this particular room full of study. R.I.P. Whoops. And she she enters the room and and she meets a big new character, Dr. Mary Malone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she's exhausted real exhausted Mm -hmm. she's going through a little bit with sort of figuring out how to either get funding continue getting funding even though she's sort of hit a dead end and this kid walks into her office and starts i don't know being the very lyra about everything (laughs) (laughs) the alethiometer tells her like she where should i go next and it tells Mm -hmm. her to go to this place go to the second floor and go find it and then it says to her do not lie to the scholar Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. When she encounters, then when she encounters Mary Malone, I mean, I just imagine her like me at the end of the day of the school day. I'm frazzled. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I still have a ton of work to do. I have like, oh, and I'm just like, you know, and then my children are like, mom. And that's how I feel like she looked at Lyra like, oh God, what? <laughs> like, what, you, what do you need from me? Like, <laughs> I, I empathize with Mary Malone. Um but Lyra comes at her with all of these things that it just like, it continually takes Mary Malone back. Like she's mm-hmm. like, wait, wait, what, who are you? Wait, how mm-hmm. do you know this? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that she, um, I kind of like, I kind of like that. She wasn't like, it wasn't like Lyra could just like ball her over, you know what I mean? Or like ball her over. She had, <laughs> she had some like, mm, wait a minute. But like, I really loved how they just kind of went back and forth and Lyra just sort of very, craftily kind of wore her down to get her where she kind of needed her. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. And, and, and a, a female scientist was something that was a little bit of a surprise to, to Lyra. She was, I think had an expectation about what the quote unquote scholar was going to be. And, and here's Mary Malone wearing the freaking blue trousers that everybody seems to wear in this world. Oh, that stupid canvas. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, we know what Lyra thinks of female scholars. I mean, she does not have a high opinion of them. And here is the alethiometer telling her that uh, this one's very important to her. Extremely important. I mean, and the way she, like, when she greets her, it reminds me of that kid that's like, hey, how are you? What's your name? How am I going to do this? And did you know that this thing happened? And then, but like, that person that kind of just comes at you, that's what she does. She's like, hey, hi, I'm Lyra. Do you know about dust? And it's a Rusikov particle and blah, blah, blah. She's like, when's the Bronze Age? And, like, she just, <laughs> bat, like, machine guns this woman. Yeah. That sounds like my child. <laughs> And, and the big thing that <laughs> sort of bowls Mary Malone over, I think, initially, because she's sort of absorbing all this. This kid is, you know, spewing at her. But it was that 30. 30 it, oh, the thing is wrong. It's 33,000 years old. And she's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Just like we are sort of when we hear that she says that, even though it doesn't really affect her as much as it affects us as the reader. But then here it is affecting Mary Malone in the same way it affected, mm -hmm. it affected us, you know, 10 pages earlier. And she starts to listen. Not that she wasn't listening before, but that really made her listen. Yeah, right. I feel like Mary Malone is gonna, is like our first real point of view character that we, our point of view, the audience point of view character. Yeah. yeah. So Will, I don't think was that just because you know Will's got his own thing going on. There, all kinds of yeah. things are going on with Will. Obviously not Lyra, but Mary is pretty much us. You know. And yeah. uh, I like that we, we have that, uh, even though it's in the second book, I like that we now have that hook in mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's like the every man mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. And I love at one point, you know, Lyra's coming at her and coming at her all that stuff. She says, why am I listening to you? Like, she, <laughs> she's just like, I must be crazy. Like, she's just, she's just so exhausted. But she, you know, but Lyra says just enough that the woman's like, how do you know this? How do you know this? At what point did she make the coffee? Was this like right in the middle of it all? Yeah. Yeah. She, she decides coffee. to listen. Yeah. Yeah. She makes her coffee. Yeah. I really hope the TV show doesn't have her making instant coffee, though. I, I'm seriously, I will be bitter. Well, it's just like instant has... coffee. Yeah. No, it's it's going to be a French press. Don't worry. <laughs> Are you sure? Travels. She seems more like she needs a Keurig. Maybe just a Keurig, yeah. Just that in there. She's just pushing that one button. Yeah, yeah. She cannot wait for it to steep. Yeah, I don't have time for this. Right. She's just like, whatever. So no percolator then? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so she and they, they really start to, Lyra really starts to talk and she really starts to listen. And they start bouncing ideas back and forth. And we get some inf interesting information here, which is that dark matter or shadows appear to be similar in description to what Lyra believes that dust is. She's been talking about dust, 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 dust in this scene. And Mary starts to realize that what she's studying, and of course the alethiometer has led Lyra here anyway, they're studying the same thing or they're looking for the same thing. Mm -hmm. And Mary has a computer program, a computer that is built to, well, we're not sure what it, does until Lyra sits down at it, but it appears to be a computer version of an alethiometer. Right. Right. And no one's ever used it quite as well as Lyra did. Of course not. Right. That was that was pretty cool. That was strap, cool. The, strap the stickers on her head she gets and just the kind six of six points on her head mm -hmm. and she takes off and Mary's floored. And she's never seen anything like this. He's never right. seen it used this way. Eaton Lyra's able to bring things up on the screen. She basically recreates the alethiometer or the look of the alethiometer because she's familiar with with the symbols that mm -hmm. and, and how she reads it with symbols. So she puts the symbols from her alethiometer on the screen. She creates a whole GUI for it. Yes. Like oh, that's yeah. That was yeah. total. That was like Steven Spielberg. That reminded me of of uh, Jurassic Park. When um, it's a Unix machine yeah. and <laughs> she dives yeah. into the 3D representation in 1992. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The air, yeah. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good with this. Lyra, go. And, and I love she... that they call it the cave. Yeah, what, yeah. That, was, that was an interesting way of describing I, I, it. I, I'm wondering, like, it made me think, so, like, what are they talking about? Are they talking about, like, like isn't it Aristotle or Plato with the cave and the uh, shadows? Plato and the Alamore. Plato, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, I'm wondering if that's because it's shadows and, like, the shadows. Weren't it, like, the shadows on the wall? Yeah. For that, for that. So I'm wondering if maybe that's part Actually, of it. Actually, I have it right here. 
Spit it out. Was, it's it's uh, on its way. Choo, choo, choo. Okay, it's about uh, two prisoners, and um, in the allegory, Plato likens people untutored in the theory of forms, chained in a cave, unable to turn their heads. All they can see is the wall of the cave. Behind them burns a fire. Between the fire and the prisoners, there is a parapet, along which puppeteers can walk. <coughs> Excuse me. The puppeteers, who are behind the prisoners, hold up puppets to cast shadows on the wall of the cave. The prisoners are unable to see these puppets, the real objects that pass behind them. What the prisoners see in here are just shadows and echoes cast by objects that they do not see. So basically, it's about seeing, you know, um, the shadows or specters, or uh, you know, and um, not seeing the world for what it is, but just seeing what's left behind from the world. It's a uh, very, uh, it's it's a very matrix type uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the you know the the look of the matrix, you know, how the symbols are sort of falling like that. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Could they yeah. could. They could very much be similar in that way, uh, but yeah, it's also you know the 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 cave. It's as simple as the cave is like a a dark hole. <laughs> you know, it's like mm-hmm. kind of you know, filled with unknowns, mm-hmm. and uh, and I don't know how well they've figured out how to use this thing yet. Obviously, Lyra uses it better than she's ever seen anyone use it before. How far have they gotten in using this at this point? Not enough to convince people to fund this research. Mm-hmm. So, right. are, how do they even know that it works? I think they mentioned that somewhere, and I'm trying to find where it is that they, that there was something because the way that they the way that um you have to use it, they knew somebody must have had tried because what they said was you have to go in and you have to concentrate, right? You have to concentrate, and and of course, as we read it, we're just like I mean, we can see immediately it's just like the alethiometer, but I, I think there was somebody that I, at some point she says like this is like this person only could get it to like barely like spark like mm-hmm. barely have a little bit you know but Lyra was like creating images but I, I can't find it exactly. I have found it. Let's see. Um, she what's interesting to me is that uh, she compares the alethiometer to the I Ching. Yes. yes. Or, I'm sorry, the I Ching. Yeah. Yes. And um, kind of suggesting that uh, the alethiometer is a thing that's always existed for humanity. We just kind of need to know how to access it. Right. Mm-hmm. And they dig a little bit deeper into dust or shadows appear to have a consciousness. Mm hmm. That messed me up. Mm hmm. That mess like that messes me up. Yeah, and we got goes, a taste of it. Yeah. And now this is like confirmation. Yeah, because it goes back to that conversation that Pan and Lyra had in the Golden Compass when he's like, what do you think makes it work? And he was like, they're like spirits or like this or that. Um, and I remember I remember from my, our podcast that we were saying like there's there's this way, it feels like it's this other kind of being, but you don't really have that yet. But this is like that dust isn't now isn't just a thing like original sin like it isn't just this abstract like kind of idea it's like it's a being like it's a sentient it has moods mm-hmm. like i don't i just i cannot wrap my brain around that at all mm. maybe the church is right and dust is the devil <laughs> oh no <laughs> well she says you know um, is dust good or evil lyra's really really wants to know this this is something that's important to her mm-hmm. and mary's like I got into this to get out of the good evil debate. Like yeah, I, I got into science <clears throat> to sort of ditch the whole idea of good or evil and just get into, I assume, fact and, you know, absolutes. Right. And even this is rocking her world too, because it is sort of it's more complex than that. What mm-hmm. she's looking for is a more absolute, a more scientific uh, you know, a, a scientific study. And now it's like, oh my God, this is like we're communicating with something here. Mm-hmm. It's bigger than her and bigger than Lyra. Right. So Mary and Lyra obviously have struck up quite a relationship right away. Um, Mary's kind of blown away, but my, Mary wants Lyra to come back the next day and meet someone. I'm not really sure who this is, but I guess it would be a colleague. 
and Lyra does agree to come back and meet her. And interestingly, uh, without she doesn't even question who the person is, what it's about. She's just like, yeah, I'll come back. Lyra trusts um, Mary implicitly. She's been led to her. The Lithium are told her to tell her the truth. She told her everything, including like where she's from. She's from a different world. Like so much that Mm -hmm. she's dropped on her. And I guess if this woman is like, please come back. I want you to meet someone. She's going to have, she's going to carry a certain weight and is going to go along with it. I don't know that I would have, even with, Mm -hmm. even with their relationship. Mm -hmm. Who is this other person? Like, do you want to bring it? You know, she could maybe consult the alethiometer about the additional person, but it was funny. Another thing that kind of came up in this was, uh, very shortly after this, when she's with Will, she was saying how like you could overuse the alethiometer, and the alethiometer can kind of get annoyed with you. Yeah, if you ask it too much stuff. Right. So she does. And we were like, why doesn't she use it more? And she must. Maybe she has an awareness that like you know she's got to be more careful with how she uses it, or it will like be over her and stop answering. Well, that's the thing. Lyra knows how to read her room. She sure you does. Yep. Well, that is a, that is Lyra's key skill. And yeah. she knows when to push and when not to. Yeah. So she, she hooks up with Will. She kind of surprises him. He, she sneaks up on him. He's in His head's in the clouds right now, right. big time. She sneaks up on him. He's like, oh, I didn't see you there. She goes, you weren't looking or whatever. Um, and they have a little bit of a contentious scene here where some police... He's scared. He's still sort of scared, although he does... He does think about how this is he's really thought more about how he's killed someone. Right. It's kind Mm -hmm. of gnawing away at him and he's able to spend a little time with how Mm -hmm. that, you know, that thought. But finally, a part of that comes to where he was protecting his home and he's protecting his mom, which I was kind of waiting for him to come to the realization that he didn't just like premeditate and like go out and kill somebody in the street. Someone was in his home. Right rooting through his stuff who had already been menacing his parents, not to say that murder is justified, but he, he's not just some, he didn't casually murder this person. He's protecting himself and his, and his home. Mm-hmm. So he's, so he's chilling. Lyra comes up on him and, and some police are there and she's like, Oh, I know how to, I sort of know how to uh, trick people. It's real easy here. And she steps to these cops and she's like, Hey, I'm, we're, you know, we're lost. Uh, this is my brother. We're looking for whatever. And Will is just like so mad at her for drawing attention uh-huh. to them. And she's like, no, this is how you do it. He says, in order to be not seen, you blend in. And to her, you overwhelm people in a way. And like, why would someone who was a criminal come up and talk to a cop? You know, like maybe she's sort of seeing they're they're very different in these scenes and their their pr- approach is really different. We're seeing those differences really, really come to the surface. Yeah. And, yeah. and they, it was. They, a, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying, and they accuse each other of not being serious enough. Yeah. <laughs> like I just, you know, so like he is just livid mm-hmm. that she is drawing attention He's like, you're not serious. You're like playing a game. Like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm not serious. She's like, you're not serious. You, the first thing they're looking for is just some, if they're looking for you, they're looking for a kid alone. I just saved our butts because it's, um, now you have a sister and they're not looking for somebody with a sister. Mm -hmm. Um, But they just kind of go back and forth like that. And yeah, I, I, I love it. They said they were quarreling passionately but in subdued voices, like a married, <laughs> like a married couple. Yes. Kids, mm-hmm. kids are going to hear us mm-hmm. and I'm not going to do this again. Like, He's shaking. Like, oh, <laughs> He's yeah. so mad. He's shaking. Oh, yeah. And oh, Lyra yeah. says, well, you're not serious. And you wouldn't even have come through, you know, you weren't even going to come through. Uh, they're very accusatory to each other. And then she calls up the lithiometer and she's like looking, digging into his history a little bit. And that makes him even more crazy. You know, she oh, really, okay. she's like, okay, these are all, this is your, your backstory, you know. Mm-hmm. Of course, she stops short of asking whether Will's father's alive, mm-hmm. you know. But she does kind of find out a little bit more about his history, and he's very upset about that. And he says, "You could have just asked me." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminded me a little bit of uh, those those uh, scenes in in things when um, somebody's a telepath and they can read your mind, and you're like, "No, get out of my my thoughts." Yes. You know, yes. Like, there there are some places that you don't want to have uh, violated. You know, absolutely. It's part 
and your thoughts are are definitely uh, definitely high on that list. And they're kids too. They're still kids. Yeah, yeah. You right. kind of forget, yeah. but they're like you know, they they got they're kids. Yeah. Um. So they uh. So there's a, a nice moment where they have to kill some time until it's nighttime. Um, unless you want to talk more about that stuff. Uh, they oh. so Will's like we need to kill some time. Wait till it's nighttime. So let's go. Uh, do you want to go to the movies, basically? And Lyra, mm-hmm. this is a great kind of very brief but very lovely fish out of water, you know, sequence where Lyra gets to have hot dogs, popcorn, co- more Coke, which we already know she <laughs> loves, and watch two movies and then have hamburgers. So here's my question to you. This is like 1995. What two movies did she see? Good question. <laughs> oh, man. He, I was Good almost question. waiting for him to wow. say what it was. But yeah, me too. Yeah. I got, I got two oh. potentials. Go I think he's it. smart enough not to date himself by putting an actual. Totally. Right. He like he he played it well, but oh my gosh, nineteen. I'm trying to think what even was going on in 1995. They do, they do reference though that uh, he was born in 1985. Yeah. In the letters, so yeah. and we know that he's about 11 years old. So, so we do know 86? that. Uh, or yeah. Uh, 96. You 96. Mean? Yeah. So we do. It is dated. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, they went to see Space Jam, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I hope they didn't go see Kids. Oh, oh dear! No, oh, geez, no. Was that uh, in '96? We're getting close. Yeah, that's I for don't sure. Know. Um, I don't remember. Let's see. Matilda uh, would be a fun movie to see. Apollo thirteen is ninety five or uh, ninety five, so that's that's too early. Yeah, well, I tell you what, feedback at theamberspycast dot com. Send us in your double bill. They go to different theaters, but double bill. What did they watch? Um, one was filled with kids, so there's a little bit of a, a tell there that maybe there, it was a kids movie. What Disney movie was ninety mm-hmm. ninety six? Um, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Hunchback. Oh. Wait, wow! Hunch- did, you just call, did you just call that up from your noodle? I, I wish I could say I did, but uh, you no, have it up I, on I'd the screen. Okay, up. all right, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> but no, we've got uh, there's several options. Disney was pretty pro- prolific that year. Yeah. Um, we had D three, The Mighty Ducks, uh, Homeward Bound two, oh. uh, Hunchback, and uh, Glenn Close's Hundred and One Dalmatians. Any of the, you know, I think the Homeward Bound would be interesting for someone who's lived with a demon their whole life, because yeah. uh, it's very much animal centric. And yeah. Hundred One Dalmatians uh-huh. would also be terrific because uh, it's almost an allegory for what she's been going through with Mrs. Coulter and how she's um, taking away kids' demons. So and uh-huh. like uh-huh. and and Corella Deville's taking away the Dalmatian puppies to make a coat. Yeah, but um, there are two thematic, uh, two other uh, thematically similar movies that came out that year. Oh, um, Har- Harriet the Spy. Sure. Um, okay. With yeah. Michelle Trachtenberg and Rosie okay. O'Donnell. Okay. So I can see Lyra <laughs> enjoying that. And uh, since we're talking about uh, multiple and alternate universes, uh, Kazam with Shaq. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the Mandela effect. Uh, there is a Shazam movie that uh, people think that uh, Sinbad did. Yes. That also would have come out in 1990. Oh my god! I'm so, convinced I saw it. And <laughs> I know I'm convinced I saw it. that you probably went through one of the portals and saw it in Chittagaze. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say that Lyra would not have sat through a Rosie O'Donnell movie. <laughs> Unless she it was a league, a league of their own, she would have. Maybe. She would have had yeah. none of that. She would have been like, no. Yeah. Uh, all right. So they, you know, when, another great observation that she makes is that people walk and eat. And she's like, we don't walk and eat. I was like, it's so specific, but so true. We do walk and eat in our world. And it that's is kind of we weird. We do. That's all, all we do. Time. Yeah. Well, I eat and cry over the sink at night, so it's a, it's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so they, they so they they stay in the movie theater until about eleven o'clock, and they finally go back and they head back to Chittagaze, uh, and 
Whoa, do they come back to Chis- Chittagaze. There is some ish going down when they come back. Yeah, Talk to is. me. Uh, so, are we talking about the kids and the cat? The kids and the cat. Yeah. The screaming, the screaming or the yowling yeah. yes. from, yeah. from the tower in yes. the center of town. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand what it's about. Um, I don't either. They're, I, I, they're, they're terrified of felines yes, and cats for right. some reason. And and there's no real explanation for it. There's no. I, I mean, there's no explanation for it. At least not no. that we've read. Not so far. It's so different. The world is different. That's but all we know. Be a real, but but it's got to be real. Like you mm-hmm. can't. It's not some super uh, superstition. This is this is a real fear. Yeah. Um, because right. here's here's the the key passage for me is um, then Angelica's voice came clearly. You ain't from here. You ain't from Takarase. You didn't know what about specters. You don't know about cats either. You ain't right. like us. Mm-hmm. So clear, yeah, clearly cats are just as awful as specters. But maybe cats in this world really do steal babies' breaths. Yeah. Oh, you know, breath. like the old story. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, it, it's 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 terrifying, but you know Lyra and Will step in, and Will has a connection to this cat a little bit. The, this cat led him. This is the same cat that that Travis loves, that pointed out the hole in the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, he goes and grabs that cat right right up. Mm-hmm. He pushes some kid down, and they are ready. real close to fighting. Oh yeah. This is my quote. You ready for my quote? This is the quote that I, lo- mm-hmm. I loved. Um, Will, would have, uh, Will would have gladly joined battle. There was a current of electric hatred between the two of mm-hmm. them that only violence could ground. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Yeah. 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 That, that's fire right there. Yeah, that was fantastic. That was fantastic, and and so the kids are still they're holding stones and sticks. They're gonna they're gonna stone and stick this cat to death. That is right mm-hmm. about to happen, and the 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 cat's already damaged. The cat mm-hmm. has a broken tail, which we find yeah. out later. Uh, the cat's ear is is significantly hurt. Uh, so they rescue this cat, and the the kids don't really break up until Pan gets real big and real swole. And steps to them as a cat, mm-hmm. a big cat. Right, a and big they, cat. They freak and bolt like immediately. As a, a spotted leopard. Yeah, like just imagine that. That <laughs> <laughs> they they think they're they're you know they're they're getting on this little tabby, and then this big tabby come, comes up right behind them and and roars. <laughs> yep. So they bolt, and you know Will. Will's really connected to this cat. What was the cat's name? I want to say Maggie, but that's not it, is it? Was it Moxie? Moxie. Or Moxie. was it Moxie? No, Moxie like was that? his cat. That was well, his. Oh, that's right. He, uh, maybe this Did cat doesn't this have, cat have, have any. Maybe I don't think so. I don't think so. But, it's, but it is a female Moxie. cat for sure. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's going to play into the future of this book. Sure. Yeah. What's the importance right. of this cat? Right. But that's right, because the demon is. The- Opposite, opposite gender as well, right? Wow. Maybe they have more of a connection than just, you know, happenstance. Huh. Hmm. So another piece of this is they look up. This gave me a little bit of the chills, actually. Yeah. They look up and there's someone watching them, uh, an adult, from this mm-hmm. tower window. I got kind of the spooks. I don't know what who this person is, but I want to know more like immediately. Yeah, and it's just I, I, I'm so I'm kind of tired of adults just like watching Lyra. <laughs> like it's just so weird. Um, but it is. It said you know it, they, she looked up at the battle, uh, the battlemented rim and saw somebody looking over. Not a child, but a man, a young man with curly hair. Yeah. So and that's it. That's our description. That's it. Yeah, and obviously, so close enough to kind of see, you know, mm-hmm. that they have mm-hmm. curly hair. Mm-hmm. And that was a young man. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, how is he safe from the specters? I don't know. What when do they yeah. like, when do they consider an adult? At I mean, we, we haven't or... seen anyone who's a young man. Everyone seems to be a kid who's in the city. So it's mm-hmm. got to be that same kind of puberty kind of range, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe. Although we're not sure, uh, right. or how, how this guy can be protected. 
Um, no. well, I, I assume we're going to find out soon. Uh, so we we jump from Chittagaze. Are we kind of done with Chittagaze at this point? Well, don't we shouldn't forget. Well, we've got the, the letters. The letters. Oh, God, yes, yeah. the letters. Okay. Uh, you guys want to jump on that? Yeah. Um, I feel like we, we got John Perry's whole... Uh, the his whole story, all the important parts on three we, letters. We, 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 very thorough, mm-hmm. but uh, he was clearly looking for uh, a hole in the world not dissimilar to the one that uh, Lord Azrael created. Um, I'm you know, I, I read this and I kind of think that there is some kind of uh, uh, time association as well. Uh, because you know, Lord Azrael would have created this hole, and then everyone in these other worlds is now is seeing it later at kind of like different points in their history. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, uh, John Perry seems to, to be really good at um, adapting himself to other situations and changing his personality. Mm-hmm. Maybe like the the superpower of all of the, the, the protagonists in this series, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Lyra can do it. Will can do it. Now we find out that Will's dad has that uh, that ability. It seems to be a, a thing that uh, all of the good people are really good liars. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, I feel like this is kind of like when we learned all that stuff about Lee Scoresby in, like, the two or three passages about his balloon, and we got, like, all of this information uh-huh. about about him. Um, but there, there's two things I love about this part. One is that it said a little later when the cat had curled up to sleep, Will took a cup of coffee in the green leather case and sat on the balcony. Like, I like to believe in my heart that Will sat there until that cat got off his lap. Like, it might have been hours. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. just, like for the sure. Cat, the cat's on my lap. I can't move. So I then can't finally, do anything. I, get, I got away. And then when he finally, the cat went somewhere to lay, he's like, oh, now I'm going to go. I feel like Will would do that. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, what I do. Sure. Like, I'm like, I can't move. I'm like, I say to my husband, Travis, can you get me that? He's like, I'm like, the cat's on my lap, you know. <laughs> and if anyone needs that kind of calm and relaxation that only a pet in your lap can give you, it's right. Will right now. This is Absolutely. what he needs. And this is like a, mo- a sort of a demonish moment for him where he has a little bit of a, a little bit of calm. Right. Mm-hmm. But the other thing I love about this is, you know, we're learning about, you know, he's like, this military man, he's like pretending to be dumb to like, but he's extremely intelligent and he's working all these angles. But I love that every he begins every letter with darling. Oh, every letter to his wife I is know. darling. And and you know, at some point he says, you know, my love to you both, give my love to Johnny, kiss the boy for me. Like, and I think that was so important for for Will to read. But I think it was a Will great learned year. that he was loved. Yes. And that his family was that his family, he, he, he comes from a family that loved each other. Right. That, yeah. He didn't just leave, you know, he didn't uh-huh. just leave them. Mm-hmm. He was, he was, yes, he was on an adventure and yes, he, he was, he was traveling. He was away from his family mm-hmm. um, on an expedition, but he didn't just abandon them. Something happened. It wasn't reading these letters. He, he would want to come home. He would he want to see. There again. would be a point when he comes home. Yeah. And, Something kept him away from that. Maybe yeah. the most important of most important information in these letters in this in these letters mm-hmm. is that uh, certainly mm-hmm. for Will, of course, you know we this this anomaly is an important part for us, the reader, that there's something unique going on up there. Uh, and you know when we talk, when we find out what Lee finds out later, we find that there's some what happens up north. There's a lot of stuff happening up there. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so do you want to move on to the Lee stuff? Lee, Lee's interrogations at the bar where he's just feeding people, uh, vodka, like free and streaming. I love so it. Let me just say, before we get started, this might be my favorite chapter in the whole series so far. <laughs> I loved everything about this chapter so much. It's like so everybody much. he talks to has this much information and mm-hmm. Lee, Lee is basically looking for this much, and every little person adds a little bit that's like slightly different, and he's kind of like putting together this picture of 
of this guy and what he was doing up here. Mm -hmm. and, and then randomly somebody else will offer some additional detail from across the room and he'll be like, oh, tell me more. And then it's like he pours him a drink and he pours this guy <laughs> right. a drink. You know, it's so funny. Even the bartender has stuff to say. It was yeah. it was really fun. Uh, you know, and, and um, but this I'm I'm sorry. I was yeah, just go, go ahead. Say, the reason I love this so much is that the the stakes in this chapter keep getting bigger mm -hmm. until the end of it. And I, I'm not going to spoil it because we're we're getting to the end of the conversation. But it just keeps building until you get to this end, and just oh my god. Mm -hmm. It, I it, I've never read a single chapter in a book that's so wonderfully constructed. Mm -hmm. hmm. It does start light and interesting, uh -huh. and it, and and it it's fun. Uh, but you know, once he gets on the sledge and heads up to the observatory, it's, a little adventure starts. But it's still yeah. the same chapter. You know, it's not yeah. like something changed or you've changed point of view. He's really going on an adventure, uh -huh. uh, and. You know, it's even fun, still kind of fun when he's sitting in the common room with these five, five um, sort of astronomers and having uh -huh. these conversations right. and finding more information. And they're filling in these gaps in information. And then the whole thing kind of goes off a cliff as, you know, 10 minutes out of the door. And you know what? It goes, you know, stuff goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, this is this is like a mini Western. Yeah. In a chapter. Yeah. Uh -huh. Starts out in the bar. He's bantering, you know, he's kind of that low key, like, let me get you a drink. And people are like, I heard he did this. No, he didn't. He did this. And like, he's kind of, and then he moves into like the more important part where he's up in the observatory and, you know, and this is where the stakes get higher. And this is where like the do 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 Dude, yes. Cause like he's yeah. looking at the magisterium guy and the magisterium guy's looking at him cause he asked about dust. And mm -hmm. then there's the, sh and then there's the showdown. Total showdown. Yeah. At the end. Yeah. And shout amazing. out to Hester, man. Hester saves his butt. Yes, Big Hester time. is so like amazing. Like twice. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. And we is this the first time we hear her speak? Do you guys know for sure? Because she definitely speaks in this, and I, I don't remember her speaking in, in Golden Compass at all. I don't think Not she that does. it matters, but yeah, she, she saves him twice. Mm -hmm. She, you know, notices the, the bird, and then yeah. she says, watch your back twice you know so she she's she's on the ball they also describe her as having like sharp claws too mm -hmm. so she's a fighter right. she's a fighter of course she would be right i mean like lee's not going to have some like little fluffy bunny you know he's right. going to have a, a little bit of hard edge bunny i also like how she's described as having her ears kind of laid back on her this is a small detail but i love how she's described with her ears laying back on her neck and her back and she's very sleek and interesting looking. I can't wait. To, I love Hester. I can't wait to see more of her. <laughs> and it's so Lee, right? Like it's that so is so Lee. Lee. Mm -hmm. I mean, just laid back and, and uninteresting, but inside he's like, and, and, and not even like deep inside, just like right, right underneath. He's uh, just a fighter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's in trouble now, right? Lee's in, mm -hmm. in, in real big trouble mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, an agent of the church is, uh, dangerous alive and dead but in particular dead because you know they're going to be looking for him and he's already called the church yep. to, yes. to come find Lee oh so god Lee's yes. got to got to move yeah they sent a raven already mm -hmm. uh, yeah that was the worst news probably is that he was already they they were already aware they're already aware that he's asking questions yeah so right. Grumman is important to them too right right Right. So uh, before we go on, yeah, go ahead. Do you guys think Grumman is alive or dead? Alive. I think he's alive. Same. Okay. Okay, that's three for three. All right. There was there was no one that offered. You know, everyone's description of his death was more elaborate. Mm -hmm. You know, he got buried under a thousand tons of rock. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was like maybe the most elaborate. <laughs> oh no, he wasn't beheaded. It, it was just the fact that he was in an avalanche. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, okay. The or earth literally that? opened up and swallowed him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, that, I think, yeah, he's alive. I think he's alive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, Serafina, do you guys want to talk a little bit about her adventure here? I'm trying to gather my thoughts. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm still like lingering in the lee scoresby section um which was great 
We could talk it, about it, more about Lee. Oh yeah, no, no, no! It's not that. It's, it's not stuff. that I have more. I'm just sort of changing gears. Changing this gears. this is a big right turn in tone because it sort of goes back to you know someone who's who's you know that plot hasn't been fleshed out yet. We don't really know mm -hmm. uh, other than the fact that the you know she takes her team through to Chittagaze. Yeah, and we get to see a a. a adults perspective on the specters yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they see they see an attack and they don't know they don't understand what's going on because they've never seen them before right um and so they're watching and you know of course to them they see these two adults you know there's there's a whole bunch of people together and a whole bunch of children and then when the specters start to attack the two adults in the front just ride off run away they just go off mm -hmm. on their horses and then so then they're watching and they're seeing these i mean they don't know their specters at the time but they're seeing these things attack these adults the children are crying um and seraphina peckla saves one mm -hmm. right is it isn't is that the is that the one in the river well she saves the child right she saved right is that the is that the child she saves in the, the river one yeah, the, river? yeah. the father yeah. just kind of stops caring once that was the... an awful scene yeah, yeah. That was an awful scene for me. Like it was, I, I, I mean, just with like a lot of the different things happening at the border mm -hmm. and like him going through the water with his That's child what I and, then, too. and him not making it and like, you know, and then just kind of being totally, you know, and the little, and then the little one crying for him, like Serafina has the little one and mm -hmm. looking back and seeing that the father is totally mm -hmm. like that was, it was hard to read that part. It was. We had heard what they did but seeing it actually happen and in context was more devastating right and what it and how it strip what it strips away of a person and what it leaves behind or what they leave behind was very upsetting almost like in a way the demon separation like that's it's right. sort of I, yeah that's exactly yeah. what i was gonna say right yeah. like is this the is this the other world version of intercision mm -hmm. well we all know that we know now that the demons are inside the people of Chitikaze, mm -hmm. just like uh, our world. Mm -hmm. And these things come in and like suck something out of you. I'm guessing it, that that's what they do. They, they suck out uh, the demon. Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't die. The adults don't die. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they, because it kept saying like she looked, I don't know if it was a little boy, or a little girl looked back and was calling for their father. And then he was just in the river, like just standing there, mm -hmm. like not moving, not looking, not caring. Um, but, the reason I was I, I had the exact same, I think, uh, viewpoint of, of this scene that you did, uh, Joanna, was this one passage here where it said the specter had caught up with him. And as the child clung to the father's back, crying, the man slowed down and stood waist deep in the water, arrested and helpless. And like you said, right. that, that really just had a lot of uh, real world connotations that... Mm -hmm. uh, or it made made the scene I think all the way here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so if if this is how they leave someone, would there be sort of adults peppered across the landscape, just milling around? Do uh, would they stop eating? Would they just die? Like, what would happen to these people? What's going to happen to him? Probably. I mean, they don't even have on this world, you know, demons to want. You know, right, they right. would where 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 you know Tony was wanted ratters, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, in, in here, you know, they don't even know what's missing. They just know something's gone. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they just like like you said, I think they just wander. Yeah, I mean, we know, and we know from the previous book when they got into that room at Bullvanger, they there was demon after demon in the jars. Mm -hmm. Which meant their which meant their human was somewhere mm -hmm. alive, mm -hmm. you, you know, and only and then Tony's Tony's jar was empty, but so, so yeah, I think that's really that's probably right. Like they just are going to be like that, just be like that forever. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Yeah, so. it's, yeah, yeah, uh, unsettling for sure. Well, and then very quickly before we move on, like. When Serafina goes to, this is what's interesting to me, when she goes to save the child, one of the specters gets close to her and she feels a dullness in her heart. And I thought mm -hmm. that was fascinating that it could, 
I guess it, I don't know why it was fascinating to me that it could have possibly done that to a witch. Like somehow I feel like a witch would have had some other kind of ability to resist it. Or, you know, I mean, they can resist like all these other natural things or have like this immunity to all these other natural things. Mm -hmm. But she got too close and it, she felt it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if having the demon outside um, makes them not immune. Maybe it does. It makes them immune to what the specters do. Hmm. Because 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 they'd have to have a an exact hold on the soul. yeah on the soul, right? And they and, they can't have that, right? And for witches in particular, they can send their soul, mm-hmm. you know, great distances away from them. Mm-hmm. 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 So I'm just wondering, like. So that like almost Serafina or someone from Lyra's world or Serafina's world as an adult in this world, the specters would be drawn to the demon, not the human. If they're looking to take that away from them, right? They would, like they would be drawn to that. Yeah. I, wonder if, I wonder if we would see something like that because the demon is maybe what they want. That that energy is what mm-hmm. they want. Mm-hmm. Right. Seraphina, yeah, just like you said, Joanna, there is Seraphina's is you know whatever somewhere right. else. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about the Ben Alim? Yes. Yes. That was incredible. Mm-hmm. That whole sequence, and this is why I said you know it, it built. From the Lee scene to the Serafina scene to the Bene Alim scene, it just became more and more like this scale just became more and more epic. Mm-hmm. You know, it went from your your shootout at an old saloon to to uh, gosh, there's a there's a way that uh, she that uh, they describe the the angels that just amazed me. Um, oh yeah. Um, nor uh, nor did she know how far their awareness spread out beyond her like filamentary tentacles to the remotest corners of universes she had never dreamed of. Nor that she knew them as human formed only because her eyes expected to. If she were to perceive their true form, they would seem more like architecture than organism, like huge structures composed of intelligence and feeling. Mm-hmm. I was driving when I heard that, and I was like, I you know, I almost like just lost not control the wheel for a second it was that may be my favorite description of anything in a book ever. Mm-hmm. right that would that more like architecture than organism like huge structures composed of intelligence and feeling it's like you know what that should look like but you at the same time there's no way you could possibly know mm-hmm. what that should look like mm-hmm. uh, it was it's incredible it was it was just it was incredible it so, was so, it- yeah, oh, sorry. And then they say, just real quick, they say, but they expected nothing less. She was very young. Mm-hmm. Like, they're looking at her, you know, where she is looking at and where Serafina looks at humans, you know, they're looking at. She's 400, 300 years old. No, she's Ruda, right? Is it Ruda? Yeah, it's Ruda. Yeah, she's yeah, 400 Ruda. years old. Yeah. yeah. Right? And they're looking at like, oh, like, you know, like, oh, How dear precious. lamb. Yeah, yeah. dear lamb. You, you, of course, that's what you would see. You're just so little, like so. Yeah, and it was, you know, that that was such a great. But you're right. That's a that's an amazing, an amazing description. Do the angels all talk together at the same time? Because some of the passages seem to read like they're all just communicating together. Maybe they do sometimes, and maybe they don't. Maybe they're like a choir. Yeah, you know? I, like I was almost sort of almost like the Borg. You know how they all speak <laughs> at once. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, and is Lord Azriel there? She asked. Yes, he is there. The angels replied, "Like mm-hmm. they are all just talking at the same time." Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, song. and and I and I feel like the affectation would be the same as the you know. Yes, he is. Like just this very like very like yeah clean and and uh, just calm, but not harsh like the Borg. Just not hard, no, right? Just so right. layered. Right. Yeah, it's like it's a gigantic individual Enya. voices, but layered on top of each other. It's like a gigantic Enya song. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. that, I, that's the thing. I just feel like this, like when they speak, it's like Orinoco flow. You know, it's just ah, uh, 
I love the Angels. I love I love what he did with them. But like you said, like moving at once. Then uh, right after that description, there's the the part where at once they beat their wings and surge forward. So as a, in mass, they're moving like that. Mm-hmm. And they can pass between worlds easily without without effort. Yeah, easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But is it because they can see the holes that are already there? It's not like. When I was reading it, 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 it looked to me like it wasn't that they were just passing through, but they were finding the holes that others left. I think you're right. I, I, I think it's because they're so old. They know how subtle the, the differences are in the world. And they can just kind of, because uh, Ruta, Ruta Scotty had no idea. It was just like, yikes, I'm in another world. Right, because she could, she could feel, a, she felt different. And then she asks them, right. but there was nothing visual to cue that to her. Well, they say they say straight out that uh, you know how have we left the world I found you in? Where was the boundary? And she and they say that uh, uh, there are invisible places in the air, gateways in other worlds. We can see them, and you cannot. Mm-hmm. Right. So they're there without somebody having made them. They're just mm. there anyway. Right. Right. Okay. right. But, but now there's, well, I don't know if they're human made or if they're natural well, could, yeah could they have been made thirty-five thousand years ago or in this original um you know battle that went down at that time when there were there was another civilization like mm-hmm. we're playing this thing over again so maybe there's always been a way to move around mm-hmm. or maybe it was created at some time and they left the portals open mm-hmm. or it's some someone or something can open and close them at will right uh, well, yeah. It, it, have you read um, Stephen King's um, Dark Tower series? Just the first book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, um, that's another series that's multiple universes, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a concept in, in it called uh, thinnings, where um, the world is just a little, the, the, the membrane between the worlds is just a little thinner. And you can kind of push your way through. And uh, that's what this made me think of, these these gateways that kind of just exist, mm-hmm. where um, just naturally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, this this was a cliffhanger to me, like just ending up where we ended up with the, uh, you know, the fortress and the angels and the specters and oh my. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like this was so incredible. He, so how long has he been gone? Because he's got a fortress. Mm-hmm. Like it couldn't have just been the days that uh, Lyra has been gone, because Lyra jumped through a couple minutes later, and there's no way that he's got a gigantic supervillain fortress from where he's going to fight his war against God. Right, and Lyra saw things that she had had that were now in a museum. Right. Right. So mm-hmm. there's definitely time and space is a little fluid here, and I'm not mm-hmm. sure how it works. Mm-hmm. But but think of all the things that, that are at this fortress. There's the steel wing craft gliding like albatrosses, glass cabins under flickering dragonfly wings, droning zeppelins like huge bumblebees, all making for the fortress that Lord Azrael was building on the mountains at the edge of the world. So Lord Azrael has allies now from multiple worlds Mm -hmm. that are there to help him in his war against the authority. Mm -hmm. This is so darn cool. (laughs) (laughs) This is awesome. It felt to me a little bit like Saruman's like, yeah, big, you know, where he's like just breeding Yurikai and like, it's all fire and, Mm-hmm. You know, like and that's what I that's what I kind of felt like. I mean, yeah. maybe not so evil. Oh no, maybe. it felt way more evil to me. <laughs> like, like I expected, like giant. It was like Godzilla's coming out of stuff. Like this was just. Uh, this looks like a, a, an amazing fortress, like a, a Skeletor stuff. <laughs> 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 kind of but then all of these angels are going, mm-hmm. which means the angels are joining the fight against God. Yeah. Well, these got, angels, you know, right? These, these angels. angels, yeah. So, like, I'm, I'm, like, I just, I'm curious as to what did you, what did, what did you say yeah. to them to <laughs> convince them? Well, to... who's, 
like who's running the who's running the show right now mm-hmm. would be your question. If the angels are willing to join in a battle against the authority, then who is the air quote authority now to where the angels are wanting to angels can be taking sides. There could be angels on both sides, just like the the witches. There's witches on all sides. You know, these angels are definitely willing to join the fight. But maybe there's other angels that are still on board with whatever whatever the authority is doing. Well, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, that's that's heaven and hell right yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. The Elzebub is the fallen the fallen angel, and everybody else, you know, that followed with him. But that's kind of the thing, right? So excited. Um, the devil was uh, an an angel. You know, yeah. he was a peer yep. with these guys. Mm-hmm. Lord Osriel is just some dude. Mm-hmm. Like, like why? What is? What the, is it about what did they him? say about the bears? What did they say about the bears? He was the most. He was like, like he, they never encountered anything like him. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Like the bears couldn't resist him, and and like he just has this way about him that I guess he can even persuade angels. So yeah. persuasive, yeah. This is, and you know, I, I I hope that we're able to read soon about how he kind of did this, and we yeah. get to, you know, we, I was, we get a point of view chapter for from his mm-hmm. point of view. Mm-hmm. Osriel Silvertone. <laughs> ah, <yeah. laughs> for real. Any other things you want to chat about before we wrap up? Uh, there was one thing. I'm trying to... Well, actually, there may have been two things, but I'll try to keep it quick. Um, the one thing was that we had talked last week about like the specters. Uh-huh. When, when the witches are hearing about the specters, they say, you know, everything was fine until about like 300 years ago. And then all of a sudden, these specters started arriving. Uh-huh. And then the part that I was thinking about last week when I said, Aren't, are the specters new? And you said, no, they weren't. Yeah, they weren't new. But once Azrael opened that doorway, it said that the number of specters just was like, Pfft. so whereas before the specters were there, but once he opened that gate, like the influx of specters was like overwhelming. Like mm-hmm. it was just like, it was flooded. So my, I guess my question is, they said that like, dust was not necessarily a new th- like was a newer thing or the discovery of dust was a newer thing and i'm wondering if it coincides with like when the specters kind of show up like this discovery of dust or this understanding of dust if it, does it coincide at all mm-hmm. i'm just kind of curious about that yeah and, and also in history where they talked about um how the poles the position the pole positions of the earth shifted at one time and how different the climate is right now in the north because of the heat from the opening into the other worlds is melting ice and mm-hmm. and making fog and changing the the makeup of mm-hmm. of the world uh you know and something if it's happened before it's happening again so there's a big shift i mean how how much if 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 someone opened up a portal into a world that was 85 degrees it, at the you know in the middle of Antarctica, what kind of havoc would that wreak on the planet? Right. Mm-hmm. I love that too. And th- so then, and then the other thing, the other thing was I remembered. Okay. And this is it. When Ruta Scotty, when they passed through the barrier, and she's like, "Angels, how did we? How did we do that? I don't see anything." And they were just like, "You can't see it. We can." Right, they were just like, "Witch, please!" And she, <laughs> she was like, "Oh, really?" So she looks back and she memorizes the landscape, and she yeah. photographic there. She's like, uh, "I will always know where this is now." I loved it. I just it's thought that was so great. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> the angel was just like, "Witch, please!" And she was like, "No, nope, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm totally gonna memorize it." And she did. she's using practicality to she remember did. it. You know, she she don't need to use magic. She's nope. just looking. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, well, we appreciate you guys for listening. Um, we're excited about this adventure. Um, and we're going to jump into seven, eight, and nine next. Uh-huh. You know, this this is the, the leanest of the three books, and we're like yeah. tearing through this. Yeah, I think there's only 15 chapters. Yeah. Total. Well, we've got a goal. In, we've got a goal set. We've yeah. Got, we're got that show coming. We're going to try to crack this too. book. Yeah. yeah, those trailers are looking good. They're looking tight. I think they had the big premiere tonight. They did the black they did. carpet. Yep, yes. they did. Uh, uh, they had Q and A. They had an intro. They had a Q and A with all the the stars. 
Um, it, there's, and a lot of press materials coming out. Like there's a really nice story. Um, we can I'll I can link it or we can link it on the on the site about uh, Lynn's Lynn's life in Wales while they shot and his adventures as being like in Wales and not having spent any time there before. Uh, so that's really delightful. And there's a great behind the scenes um, story about uh, demons and how they use puppets and practical effects and how they are mapping CGI on top of them, which is pretty great. The, the Hester puppet in particular is pretty terrific. I was going to say that to you because I saw a picture. I was like, did you see how great it was? She so great. So great. So yeah. great. Uh, Yurik, not so great. <laughs> the <laughs> big, like giant, like weird, stiff <laughs> Yurik like, was unwieldy. a little... Like, and just like rolled out, like... <laughs> It's like when you watch the behind the scenes mistakes from like a bug's life where they mess something up and it's just this <laughs> mangled bug, like just sliding around, but it has no whatever. Yeah. That's what I'm expecting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what some of our uh, podcasting and Twitter peers are out. I know the folks from uh, Twitter Gaze, I believe, which is such a, such a great name. Yeah. That's um, great. They are, um, I believe at the premiere tonight. Yep. Yep, yeah. and yeah, some of the fans, the, some of the fan sites uh, had had representatives there, so we'll be eagerly seeing what the reactions are tomorrow. And it's going to be fantastic. Oh, well, uh, thanks before, for listening. Before oh, we ahead. wrap, I'm sorry. Before we wrap up, I did want to uh, thank a really nice reviewer. Uh, I wanted to say hi to Emma in Puerto Rico. Hello, thank you hi, for Emma. listening. Hi, Emma. We really enjoyed your review. Thank you, and everyone else, if you're listening, please leave reviews for us and. Uh, to use a, a term that my my older daughter hates, smash that subscribe button and uh, stick with us if you like the show. Agreed. And on that note, cheers. Take care. Have a good night. <laughs>